Welcome everyone uh, to the 10th episode of 30 Minutes Robotic Milking Edition. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. I'm your host, Marcia Andrews, dairy science professor and extension specialist at the University of Minnesota. With us today, with us today we also have our co-host, Jim Sulfur, their extension educator at the St. Cloud Regional Office. Hi, Jim. Hi, Marcia, and welcome everyone. So first, before we bring our guest uh, to uh, talk with us today, um, I would like to go, go through some housekeeping items. So if you're watching this on a recorded episode on YouTube uh, channel, please uh, register next time to join us for the discussion at z.umn.edu slash 30 M-I-N-R-M. All the episodes are being recorded for later viewing, but it's always great to have you join us so we can have a lively discussion. We are using the Q&A box in Zoom for uh, our questions and comments. Please do not use the chat box as Jim and I will be monitoring only the Q&A box for questions. Uh, you can find this on the bottom of the screen and you'll be typing your question and we'll be reading the question or comment on your behalf. I'm going to also be turning on a live transcript right now. And if you wanna turn that off on your computer, you also go on the bottom of the screen to do so. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. And that is Kim from Minnesota. She is joining us today to tell us about their grazing operation. So it's very unique. It's the first time we have a grazing dairy uh, in our program. So welcome, Kim. So great to see you and to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'll turn myself off <laughs> and left to uh, tell us about your farm um, and then come back for, um, for the, on the question and answer later. Just okay. I'll let All right, um, I do have here with me today, my husband, Andy. Um, he's my backup if I forget something, um, when we get to questions, if uh, there's things that he knows better than I do, which there are, um, he, he's gonna weigh in when we need him to. So um, starting with this first picture, this is the layout of our barn. Um, a little bit of background, We've been a grazing farm, I should say. My parents started in 1991 and we've been organic since 2005 uh, when Andy and I got married and came in to the operation. Um, we wanted, we knew we wanted robots. We had to build a new facility. Ours was wore out and we wanted to still be able to graze. Um, so we decided on two Lely A4s we do have a spot, if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, below those two robots, that is a spot for a third one. All we would have to do is put it in and hook it up and we'd be ready to go. And there have been talks of that, um, but we aren't quite ready for that right now. Um, we currently milk about 145 cows on our two robots. We built this barn in, Jan or we started in it in January of 2013. Um, the layout of our barn is called the checkout style, kind of like a grocery store checkout where the cows come from the holding area through the robots and then they have to exit through the grazeway right there located um, towards the edge of the barn. That grazeway is able to sort either to the left into the maternity area, sick pen, that's whatever we need it for, breeding pen. I uh, can sort to the right in the winter. That would be the way that they go. And then they can go back out to the hoop barn to lay down. Or in the summer, if they would fail for any reason, they would go back that direction and get to try again. Um, if they have a successful milking and are able to go out to graze, uh, there is a gate there that they can either be sent up to the left to the west paddocks or to the right and then they would go through another grazeway and be sent out to the east set of paddocks. <clears throat> um, we'll talk more about that 
we call it the intersection kind of behind the barn with the grazeways. We have another picture of that later on. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have for that one. Uh, this is a picture of one of our robots. This was actually right at startup. So this is an old picture. Um, we do have now the uh, shields above the feeders so that they can't push feed out and they also can't get manure into the feed. Every once in a while, there's a cow that likes to stop right in front and we don't want manure all over into our feeder. So those have helped tremendously. The cows don't seem to mind them at all as far as coming in. Um, one more thing about that last picture, um, we do feed high moisture corn and roasted beans in our robots. We toured a couple of places that were feeding high moisture corn and modeled our own feeders after them. Um, they basically are two hoppers on top of, or one hopper I should say, on top of each robot with an auger that augers in the high moisture corn. We grind it once a day in the winter, maybe twice a day in the summer. It all depends on the weather and how fast they're able to use it up. Um, but they really like that. And then we feed roasted beans alongside of it. Okay, this is a picture of our farm with the paddocks. Um, you can see our barn is down in the bottom right hand corner and there are two lanes, one going up to the west and one going up to the east. So currently we are using the ABC grazing system. We tried AB at the very beginning, mainly because we weren't sure what we were doing yet. <laughs> um, we've tried the last two years um, previous to this year, we actually used ABCD, so they were getting new pasture four times a day. It worked very well for cow movement, but it's very hard on the side of having someone to change fences four times a day. So this year, we started with a different nutritionist, and so we're feeding a little bit more in the barn than we had been previously as far as a PMR. And so we went back to the ABC system and that worked very well. So to explain what that would look like in our situation, um, about six o'clock in the morning, they would start going to the pasture on the west side, for example. Uh, they would go there until noon. At noon, the gate in the barn would switch automatically and they would start going out to the east. And the cows that would come back from the west then would either get to go right over to the new pasture if they did not need milking. If they needed to be milked, they would be put into the barn, get milked, and then they would get to go on to their new pasture. Um, then they would go that direction. Oh, I'm trying to think. I think until about six o'clock in the evening or so, 6.30, then they would we would fetch anyone that was left out in the paddocks on the west side. And then the gate would automatically switch again and they would start going back to the west. And that basically just goes back and forth like that um, from one side to the other. So any of our fetch cows would just be whoever is left in the pasture. And you just bring those back at the time that you move the cross wire. Uh, you can see in this that our main section of pasture is divided up into three large areas of smaller paddocks. Um, so in our farm, they're labeled P1, P2, and P3. And each paddock is about four acres. <clears throat> we use maxi shock wire to divide, to make the paddocks. And then we use a poly wire to give them the smaller breaks of the paddocks. Basically, it's a little practice and trial and error on how much to give them in the pasture because you want them to kind of run out so that they come back to the barn and want to go over to the new side, to the new pasture. Um, it's not so much in our case, what's in the robot, what you're feeding in the robot that drives them, but it is the opportunity to get new pasture on the other side that makes them move. Um, overall, that's worked fairly well. Um, Andy has a good illustration, or I shouldn't say illustration, what is it, a analogy when it comes to the setup. Go ahead. We just describe it as a, a casino with uh, free buffets. So when the breakfast buffet is closing, you have to walk back through the casino. When uh, the lunch buffet is open, then 
back through the casino. We just want that cow to go back and forth behind the barn as frequently as possible because that drives our visits. Um, so the more visits, the more production, the more intake. So more is better in this scenario. He describes it better than I do. Okay. Um, this year, just a side note, this year during the grazing, the bulk of the grazing season, they were getting about 50% of their dry matter intake from the pasture. This is the intersection behind the barn that we were talking about. Um, the, let's see here. Grazeway number one was the one in the barn that we saw on the drawing. That one, like I said, could either send them outside to the sort pen or back to the hoop building or, or um, holding area. Grazeway number two is the one you see, yep, right there where the cursor is. That's right behind the barn and that one either will send them up to the east lane or back into the barn or holding area if they need milking. Grazeway number three is right in the front here. And that one, I would say is most critical if we're using the ABCD system, because that allows the cows to come through and go right to the west paddocks without having to go in the barn if they don't need milking. Uh, so then it's doing the refusing for us instead of the robots, which of course frees up robot time. Um, right now, this year, we were a little short on air to be able to run that, so we had it turned off. With the ABC, like I said, it wasn't quite so important to have it running. Um, our high moisture corn feeders run off of air also. So on the wish list would be either to redo those corn feeders so that they're run off of electric um, drives instead of air or to get a bigger compressor, but I think we'd rather redo the feeders. So uh, we'll start using that again probably next summer. Yes, right behind that is our flyback. We did a study actually through the university and we would agree with what their conclusions were that it does work and help tremendously with flies. In robots, I think it's especially important because it cuts down on failures. The less flies you have since we're organic, we're a little more limited on what else we can use. And we've gone to just using the flyback and sticky traps around the robots themselves. And that seems to do a fairly decent job. Um, that flyback, yes, works, works wonders, I think. Here's a picture of our cows out on grass. Our pastures are mainly a mix of alfalfa, red and white clover, tall fescue, orchard grass, um, timothy, and some rye grass. And we try to use the more established paddocks in wetter weather, of course, that's kind of a standard grazing procedure. Um, with the ABC or ABCD system, when we use that in the barn, if we're really far away on one side, like on the west side in the morning, then the next switch, we try to keep them closer on the east side so that it cuts down on their walking. We don't want a really far paddock on one side and the other side um, for obvious reasons. We try to just balance it out and it works better for the cows as well. <clears throat> this is a picture of our hoop building. This picture was actually just taken this past week. Um, we started keeping the cows in overnight. They are grazing during the day. We're using just an AB system during the day. And then we bring everybody home just before the sun sets, which here right now is about 6 or 6.30 in the evening. Um, the daylight hours are getting to be so short now that when we were still have, leaving them on pasture at night, they would go out there and go to bed and no one would come back and get milked because they were sleeping for the night and it was dark for so long. So they their movement really drops off when the daylight hours um, diminish, which is usually for us in early to mid-October. Um, yes, we are still grazing AB during the day. We let them out about six in the morning and then their fence switches about noon and to the other side. And then, like I said, we bring everyone home by 6, 6.30 in the evening. They're housed in here over the winter. It basically mimics the pasture for us. They can go out, their feeding floor is out the door to the left. There's kind of a gate there that's very hard to see, but they can go out there to eat. And then those freezer strips hanging down straight ahead are the way into the holding area behind the robots. Um, we bed with sawdust, as you can see, and we aerate the pack 
two times a day during the winter and right at this time of year just once a day since most of them are out um, during the day we just aerate and bed if we need to before we lock them in for the evening and they'll be in here then all winter long um, winter for us I would say we'll probably lock them in full time depending on the weather of course but I would say second week in November probably and we usually start them out grazing last week of April first week of May again depending on the weather we like to have a little grass growth going out there we want to start them early enough so we can get the paddocks staggered but not too soon that we wreck the paddocks for the rest of the summer we don't want to do that either I think that's all I have thank you great overview and I think you already covered a lot of ground here but um <laughs> I'm sure there's always additional questions. Uh, Jim will join us and then we'll um, take turns asking the questions that are posted here. So the first question, um, what's in the fly back to reduce flies? The fly back. Oh, oh the, maybe the vacuum they meant, right? It's fly back. Okay, yes, yeah. or fly vacuum. Yeah. Uh, they're, maybe you want to describe this. You're more mechanical than I am. <laughs> It's, uh, it's literally just a large industrial vacuum that vacuums the flies off the back, belly, and sides of the cows. So it, the cow walks through, it triggers, it has an eye that triggers the vacuum to turn on. Um, the flies get sucked up and they get su stuck into a physical trap. And there's a trap door that opens that they think they can escape through. And then that trap door just keeps opening and closing. So the flies cannot escape back down to the cattle. Um, so um, there's a blower that also blows uh, belly flies off. Um, so in the summertime, we know if something's wrong with the fly back because we'll have an increase in failures on the robots instantly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jim? Okay, the next question, and I'll expand a little bit. Basically, the question is, what's your production and butter fat like on grazing? But do you want to comment just on general metrics, visits, free time, failures? Just what are your kind of general metrics of performance on a grazing dairy? Of course, summer is very different from winter. We are partly seasonal, which also changes things. Um, the bulk of our calves are still born end of February through mm -hmm. May. Um, so that also changes things. Our visits are, of course, way up that time of year. I would say we're at three visits uh, when they're still locked in and fresh. When we first start out on pasture, we were at 2.6, 2.7 visits, which we're told is very good for grazing. Mm -hmm. um, this time of year, they're starting to wind down a little bit in their lactations. Our first ones will be getting dried off here in December, early, no, early mid-December. Um, so we are down to, oh, I think it's more like 2.3 visits, which is okay. The fall calvers, they're doing better than that. We had about uh, 15 to 20 fall calvers and their visits are you know, 2.53 or even a little more um, for those animals. Um, production. Like I said, we started with a new nutritionist. So this year we were around 15,000 pounds. Our goal is to get up in the 18 to 19,000 range for next year. Um, doing that, we saved more of more grain this fall when we combined, we saved more high moisture corn because we did run out, I should say that this summer. So we had to buy organic dry corn which we don't want to have to do again. So that limited us a little bit. Of course, the starch is what we need when we're on pasture. And we didn't quite have the amount we wanted to be feeding ideally the second half of this summer. So I think that hurt us a little bit. Um, we just weren't prepared, I guess, for what they wanted us to be feeding. Butterfat in the winter when they're locked in. Oh, we were at four point, what was it? Three, 4.3 to 4.5, I think last winter. Um, in the summer, I would say it probably stuck around 3.8 for the most part this year. I think and you I mostly whole things, you have some crossbreds too, right? Uh, we have a lot of crossbreds, okay. yes. Yeah. Um, mainly Holstein, Milking Shorthorn, and Dutch Belted. Okay. And you talked about somatic cell counts yet? No, not yet. What is somatic, um, on average throughout the year, I mean? 
Oh, I would say between 150 and 200. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, the spring, actually, they were doing a lot better than that. We were in the low hundreds um, for quite a while this summer. I, I should add something in that would make a big difference on that. That big hoop building you saw, mm -hmm. we had a giant wind gust last spring that took the cover. <laughs> Wow. But <laughs> so we were without a building this summer. And when they did, it happened in, was it end of March? Yep. And so for the spring, mm -hmm. we were thankful for the dry spring that we did have, but that caused us more trouble than coming into summer with somatic cell count because we didn't have that cover. Sure, um, sure. We do like them to have access to that bedded pack. Um, just if they're waiting to get milk that they can go lay down if they want to. And so I think that hurt us more because we had that issue. And then when we did clean out the building and we're putting the new cover on, they didn't have any access to the building. So that messed up our somatic cell coat more than I would have liked, but that, that kind of hurt us this summer a little bit as well, sure. <laughs> but there is a new cover on it now. <laughs> That's good. Glad to hear. So I think you already alluded to this, but I had a producer from California that might I don't think she could join us live. So she asked me to ask you what she mostly wants to know is whether it's difficult to get the cows to go to the robot during the peak grass season when they rather be grazing. I think you kind of alluded to the fact that they come back because you're offering a new paddock mm -hmm. to them, but I just want to clarify to make sure that is the case in case, uh, in case she needs a little more <laughs> detail on this question. I would say having them come back to the robot is not that big of an issue. Like I said, it was a trial and error with how big of breaks to give them because you want them to um, kind of run out. You know, you don't want to short them necessarily, but you want to give them the right amount so that they think, oh, this is kind of looking older. I'm going to go get some new stuff. And they go through the robot and they do know when those gates change. They mm. have an internal clock like I mean, there's probably six or eight cows that they will wait till they see it change and then they'll get milked you know they just know that time of day when they'll be able to go to the new pasture it's kind so, of so they learn quickly you're saying so what about your heifers do they learn quick about this or a little more once, of a challenge with heifers once the bulk of the herd is uh trained in they just follow along and mm -hmm. now okay. we really have not just just getting them to learn to use the one ways outside for the first time, you know, it takes maybe a day at the most, you know, once or twice through each gate to learn where they're going and then they figure it out. And we also, um, we start our animals out grazing before they're weaned, you know, as calves. So they know grazing, um, they know grass, they know pasture. So mm -hmm. that's what they like and know. So that helps as well. Sure. Jim, I think We've the question on the question. pack, I think the question on the pack was the first kind of getting out of order somehow here. Yeah, there, but there is a question. How often do you feed your PMR? You want to talk in the mm -hmm. summer how you manage PMR feeding with grazing? Are they all grass? Are they feed a PMR? How do you manage that that PMR piece in the summer? Winter, or well, you can comment winter too, also. I'm sorry. Okay. Um winter, actually, it's it's very close to the same all year round, really. <laughs> now, now it is, you know, before we did go through a time when we fed um, no forage at all down in the barn. And so that was a little bit different. We fed only the grain and the robot and that was it. That was when we were mm. doing, you know, ABCD and really just pushing mm. the grazing, which movement, you know, was good and everything. But we, like I said, the starches, the starches are limiting factors. Mm. So the production would suffer because of that. So now uh, in the summer, we would feed it once in the morning um, as the cows do kind of know that and come back to the barn for that. Um, that's when I mentioned that we have that building open so that if we do get a slug of cows down there, they have a place to lay. So then we feed them in the morning. They, some of them will eat a little bit, go right out. Some of them won't even bother eating then they'll just get lined up and go through to the new pasture then in the afternoon oh around four or five o'clock in the afternoon we will push the feed up so that's kind of a different group that's down there then and then they get a chance to eat and they have it all cleaned up then by the next morning um, that time of year you know we really don't want anything left over in the winter obviously we never want them without 
feed because they don't have that option of going out to mm -hmm. pasture to fill in with their diet. So um, we pushed up a little, um, maybe once one extra time compared to the summer. So maybe three times, but we still feed in the morning and we just make sure that they are never without feed completely. Okay. So. And so since you talk about feeding, Kim, how much do your cows eat in the robot? Because you're not feeding all the concentrate in the robot anymore. You just described some of it's going on the PMR, but how mm -hmm. much you're feeding in the robot on average or depending on the stage of lactation maybe, but what, what do you feed? Sure, um, all of the beans protein are fed in the robot. We don't do put any of that in the PMR. Mm -hmm. um, mainly cost right now, I don't know, but so you know, but organic soybeans are very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and the corn, I would say usually six to eight pounds are fed per cow per day in the robot. Um, if we get different feeders fixed up, we may be able to tweak that a little bit. Again, our limiting factor there is the air that we have available to run those feeders. Sure. And when you say six to eight pounds, is that a dry matter basis or six to eight um, pounds? As, as, as is. As yeah. is. Okay. Sounds good. Jim, the other two questions are more related to bedding. And we have yeah, the other ones are kind of bedding. How often do you bed the pack, clean out that pack in the barn? What do you use for bedding in that pack? So you want to just comment a little bit on your pack management there? Mm -hmm. um, we use sawdust, dried sawdust. Um, we aerate, we have, what would you call our aerator? A homemade aerator. <laughs> it's a homemade cultivator. Mm -hmm. just mounts on the front of our skid steer. We have a track skid steer um, that we can back up and aerate with. That way we leave it light and fluffy. Um, there's no compaction in it. I want that opened up so we get the, the air down in. Um, that bacteria starts heating up and breaking down. Um, cows seem to like it. Our somatic cell count uh, reflects that. So it works. Yeah. As far as how often we bed, it depends on the weather, honestly. Um, with that hoop building, um, this time of year, I can bed about once every three days in the winter, if we're getting a lot of snow or if it's wetter, it might be a very, very light coating once a day. Uh, we found that that seems to work really well. I did most of last winter where I would aerate in the morning and not bed. And then in the afternoon, when I would aerate, I would just do a very, very light coating of sawdust and then that would keep it pretty nice all winter long and we did just buy some fans to put in there to help with airflow and they are not installed yet <laughs> so the cows are in the better pack and then so you're steering the pack and the cows are so it, how do you where do you put them when you're actually <laughs> cultivating we have, them? That, we have that feeding floor outside of the building okay. so okay. We're feeding, you know it's outside so we whatever Whichever ones want to go out there, they go out there and we shut a gate. And then whoever wants to go in that holding area behind the robots, the rest go there and we shut okay. that gate. Okay, yep. cool. Just just trying to imagine in my head how yep. the cow flow. A lot of times we'll, in the winter, you know, we do have a few fetch cows. And so we'll fetch them before we do that so that they can be going through the robots while I'm aerating and bedding. And then sure. Makes and sense. Let, let everybody flow again. Sure. And it, it's the barn your only source of shade? Right. Uh, we uh, we do have some paddocks with trees if it's going to be, you know, dangerous, hot. <laughs> we do have other places that we can put them um, out in the pasture. Otherwise, yes, that's our main source of shade. Okay. <laughs> or it wasn't the summer, but <laughs> with no cover. <laughs> so back to feeding, Kim, uh, what's your logic for using a meal instead of a pellet? Is that cost? Is, it, is there some other logical reasons that you have chosen to feed high moisture corn and and roasted beans versus a traditional pellet. Cost is part of it, but also the, the, the main the main part is uh, starch and binders in a pellet. Um, per pound, I can get a lot more starch into the animal through high moisture or as fed uh, just roasted beans. Um, and and cost cost is huge on an organic pellet and. That just wasn't a road we were willing to go down. And they really um, like it. <laughs> the other, yeah, the other thing is they really like it. Um, the, the main focus is that as, as the grazing and the, the PMR is managed, you manage flow for the herd. Um, the robot and the dosing of the corn and beans in the robot 
is managed on an individual level. So you can manage individually, move as a herd is kind of the philosophy that we're taking. Um, and it seems to be working. Um, it's just now trying to raise production up to a level that suits where things are at right now and where current pricing is going on, on organic soybeans and, and stuff like that. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. I'll have to stop the recording. So we stay at 30 minutes. So uh, if there's any further questions from the audience, maybe you can stay a few more minutes. But I want to thank you all of you for attending today, our episode number 10. And it's going to be uh, available on YouTube with, uh, today or tomorrow. I want to especially thank you guys for Kim uh, and sorry. Andy. And Andy, thank you, Andy. Sorry. Thank you, Kim and Andy, for joining us today and invite everyone to attend the next episode on November 18. Uh, we'll have a dairy that has 10 um, boxes, but there are groups of two boxes is the uh, AMS Galaxy system. So see you for that for the, at that time. And thank you again, everyone, for from joining and take care.